We are so pleased you've joined us today for St. Stephen's Online and we're praying for you as you watch this wherever you're tuning in from. Lord God, be with us as we worship together and listen to today's talk. Open your Bible or click on the link below to read the passage before we hear from our speaker. It's been Easter, 
surprise. Hopefully that didn't come as a shock to you. But actually one of the wonderful things is we don't stop at Easter, right? Like Libby was saying, we get to live in the fact that it's a resurrection Sunday almost every day since Easter. So we continue to be in that space. So right now we're going to be reflecting on what it means to be living in that resurrection life as we continue to go on. If you caught my sermon on uh, Easter, um, I made some sort of chemical explosion. It's all right. No harm, no foul if you missed it. But uh, it was a lot of fun. But it's one of those things that resurrection life continues to burst from the tomb as we continue on through history. It's been going on for the last 2,000 years, and it will continue on into eternity. We get to be completely saturated in this resurrection life. But that being said, we all celebrated Easter, but not everyone at the time of Easter Sunday back 2,000 years ago would have known exactly what was going on. In fact, many people didn't, including the disciples and even the two disciples we see here, despite them being graced with a nice walk with Jesus. Now, as an aside, let me tell you a little bit of a story. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I'm an American. Bear with that. Um, though I've been here for about 12 years, there's still a lot of Americanisms that stay with me. I like to celebrate Thanksgiving. Uh, I like to wear my ball cap. Often my hat is backwards. And I enjoy watching American sports still, like the Super Bowl. I will confess, though, being in Twickenham, rugby is superior. That's fair. Um, but American football still has a bit of a charm. A few years back, 2017, I was watching the Super Bowl that is up on the screen. It was the uh, New England Patriots versus the Atlanta Falcons. Now, I'm not expecting you to know a lot about American football. I will explain almost everything you need to know for this particular story, which probably is helpful. But I grew up as a young child in Foxborough, which is the town that the New England Patriots play. So it's like if you grew up here in Twickenham and you hated rugby, it'd be strange. Maybe you do. No, Again, no, no judgment. But I quite knew the Patriots was a pretty big fan. So 2017 rolls around and they're in the Super Bowl. Now, the Super Bowl, if you don't know, starts at 1130 p.m. here because of the time change. So staying up to watch the Super Bowl is a bit of a commitment. But as the game was going on, it continued to look less and less exciting. American football is broken up into four quarters, and by the third quarter, they were losing quite dramatically. The score was 28 to 9, and it looked pretty dire. By that point, it's about one in the morning, and I go, you know what? I don't have the heart to watch this team get pummeled to the last quarter. I'm going to go to bed. I'm tired. I got things to do the next day. So with the, the score being 28 to 9, and I, that having pretty much no hope, I decided, defeated, dejected, and with little to no hope, I turned off the TV and went to sleep. The next morning, there was no need to check the news. I knew what would have happened. I knew my, my team had suffered a humiliating defeat. I knew the major news outlets would say how bad the team played and how it was clear this team wasn't as strong as they were through the whole season. The day went on as usual for me. I was doing ministry things. And the nice thing about some American sports is no one here in the UK really feels the need to talk to me about them. So uh, I didn't need to dredge up these painful feelings. So I went along my daily ministry life. And then suddenly, without warning, my friend Stanley sends me a text message. Hey, did you stay up to watch the game last night? See, I was ready to hedge on how the team clearly wasn't ready, how the opposing team had done much better. Though I didn't really believe it in my heart, mind you. I was well ready to engage in those social niceties about, you know, well done, didn't the better team win, blah, 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 blah. But before I could get to any of that, a next message popped up. Overtime was crazy. Was it? So I don't know if you know this, but in American football, you need to tie to get to an overtime, a lot like other sports. And they weren't very close to tying. So suddenly I immediately look, run to the internet, start Googling, check the news. And it turns out that in my disappointment, I went to sleep too early. And I missed something that was rather spectacular. The Patriots had come back from being so far behind 
to tie in the final quarter. And then in overtime, they made the play and ended the game winning it. It was hailed as the comeback of all comebacks. People were going, I can't believe this is the game we watched. What a fantastic game. Whoever missed it was a fool. Wow, that's, that's so fun. Now, this wasn't really meant to be a long-winded pitch for the uh, celebration of American sports. But what we see with Cleopas and the other disciple is that they left Jerusalem before the story had ended. Like I went to bed before the game was over. They, in their defeat and in their sadness, in their expectation of what was supposed to happen, right? Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah. He wasn't supposed to die. Them and all the other disciples had just spent all Saturday completely mourning the loss of not just their friend, not just the one they thought was a savior, but actually everything they had hoped and believed in. Everything that they had planned for the future was dashed on the floor. And while those in Jerusalem were mourning, Cleopas and this other disciple were packing. Sometimes I think we don't sit as often as we should in that, the weight of what that Saturday must have felt like. Now, I will get to the fact that we're living in resurrection life, I promise you. But actually, something really amazing about resurrection life is it needs to come from death. That's the resurrection part. There's a deep feeling that the disciples had to go through. That Saturday for them would have been excruciating. They would have felt like their dreams were gone. They would have felt like God had abandoned them. They would have felt like there was no hope left in the world. But then, an Easter morning happened. Now, this is something that fascinates me. So Cleopas and this disciple, who could have been his wife, Mary, we don't know, could have been anybody. They know that the women went to the tomb and found the grave empty. So they were like around for a little bit of Easter morning and then decided to leave. So things were happening and they're like, oh, well, weird stuff, right? Let's go. And for me, I'm like, that's so strange, but in fact, amazingly relatable. There have been so many times where I couldn't see the interesting things that were about to happen because I was too caught up in the defeat I was feeling currently. I don't know if you're like that. But they left Jerusalem while the others stayed. And the truth was they were unable to stay till the end of the story. Nowadays, with superhero movies, it's quite normal for there to be some sort of bit of the story after the credits. Right? There's always an extra bit. If you ever go to a cinema and just see people waiting, they're not really there to see who the key grip was. They're really there to see what that last bit of the story is. They don't want to miss any bit of it. But these two disciples, they, they headed off. They walked off on this road to Emmaus. Seven miles, not a short walk. But dis- they were in this space of sorrow and defeat. And suddenly this person comes up to them. This stranger walks alongside them. Now, clearly we know who it is, right? We know it's Jesus. But they don't have a clue. It says they're kept from seeing it. And there's a lot of debate on how that is, if if what kept them from seeing that it was Jesus. Some people think that Jesus kind of kept himself secret. Given the fact that that's not quite Jesus' MO normally, I wonder if it was their deep sorrow, their inability to see what was going on. If it was what was going on in their life was too forefront in their vision to really see, so they were kept from seeing what what was really going on, who was really traveling with them. It's funny because this stranger asks them about it, and in the midst of their despair, these two disciples, these people who would have walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, knew Jesus personally, who would have been in Jerusalem for the crucifixion, the ones who were hoping that he was the Messiah. 
when Jesus asks them what, what was going on, their response was, some prophet died. In the midst of all the things that they had going on internally, they demoted Jesus because they couldn't quite bear to say, the one we thought was the Messiah, the one we thought was going to save us, the one we thought who was going to rescue us from the Romans, the one we thought who was going to free us from sin. So they demote Jesus. They make him more accessible to their heartbreak. They call him a prophet. But as they walk, what they're really doing is in their sorrow, in their blindness, in their deep anguish, Jesus is walking with them and continues to tell them truth. He reveals the truth of the scriptures. He continues to go, ah, yeah, let me explain to you who this, what'd you call him again, a prophet? Yeah, let me explain to you who this prophet really was. Flipping this tide from them being the one with the information saying, are you the only one who doesn't know what's going on? To Jesus going, actually, I think I'm the only one who really knows what is going on here. And they walk on this Emmaus road in their grief with Jesus, but unable to see that it's him who's walking with them. Truth be told, I have walked on some roads in dark seasons before in my life. And I've walked with people who have walked on even darker roads. Roads full of sorrow, disappointment, sickness, grief. Deep levels of pain. And just like the disciples walking in the midst of their grief to Emmaus, often when we're walking on these roads, our despair is so great we become blind to the presence of Jesus. It ends up being like we have scales on our eyes. And in the darkness of the present age we find ourselves in, the presence of God becomes this kind of blur. We become very consumed with our pain. We become convinced that we know how it should have gone. These two disciples know how it should have worked, right? They should have come to arrest Jesus, and Jesus, rising up in his mighty power, casts them aside, ushers in a new era of Judaism, victory, kicks the Romans out. They knew the story. They had it written in their heads so well. But that's not how it happens. I've been in moments where I knew the perfect plan for my life. I had it written well. I knew who was going to be the hero in it. I knew what was going to play out. It was all laid out. But you know what then happened? Um, it didn't go as I wrote it. How dare God. It went a completely different way. And not only was I crushed because it went a different way, but I was crushed because it didn't go the way I planned. God, didn't you know I had such great plans for me? I'm really good at making the best plans for me. Sometimes my plans were selfish. Sometimes my plans were just optimistic. But oftentimes we're encountering things that are unfair in our lives. God didn't put them in there. They're definitely not how we planned them. And so suddenly we find ourselves walking on these roads. They're long, solemn roads. And you know what? No matter who's around us, we don't see Jesus with us. where once we saw Jesus working plainly in our lives, maybe really easily, here we can no longer see him and we can no longer feel him. And the plans we've written so eloquently are lying broken on the floor. But that's not the end of the story. It wasn't the end of the story for these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And it's not the end of our story right now. Paul himself was very familiar 
with finding himself in the midst of suffering. Shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, he was really good at getting in trouble. But he says this in Romans 8.18, For I consider that the current suffering of this present time is not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. For Paul and for each of us at some point, but maybe even a few right now and today, there is a present suffering. There is heartbreak. There's something going on right now. Sickness, heartache, stress, grief. And these are all very real afflictions of the human condition. But just as the disciples on the long, lonely walk to Emmaus, we don't walk alone. But often we don't recognize where God himself is walking with us. It wasn't the suffering on the road that makes the disciples be able to see Jesus at the end. It's not that they went through this hardship. It's not that they gritted their teeth and they managed it. And it's not even because they knew how good it would be at the end because they left Jerusalem before the accounts of the resurrected Jesus were really solidified. But at the end, they walked down, receiving truth from one who they didn't know was Jesus yet. They get to the end. They invite him in. He sits with them. He meets them in the midst of this. He stays with them. He sees them to their final place. And when he's there, he shares this meal. Too often we can live in a narrative that when it goes all wrong, maybe God's not going to win. Maybe he's not going to be there at the end. Maybe it's not him at the table with us when all things are said and done. Maybe in the midst of my darkness, God has abandoned me. That might never be our brain thought. Yeah, we sometimes we know better. Clearly God's still with me. But actually in the midst of our pain, our heart is crying out, God, where are you? Why are you here right now? But the reality is, God has promised that he will not abandon us. And that no matter how it feels to us in the depths of the moment, the truth of Jesus' presence is far more real. And he has promised that he will carry on walking with us till the real end, not our perceived end. Philosopher and writer Ferdinand Sabino once said this. He said, in the end, everything will be okay. If it's not okay, it's not the end. I kind of love that. It's a great phrase. In the end, everything will be okay. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, I am sure of this. He who has began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the, at the day of Jesus Christ. If you feel like you're in the middle of something and it's not good, I want to encourage you. Yeah. There's awful things that go on. And God didn't put hard things in your life just to make it hard. But he sits with us in the midst of our grief and promises to be there, carrying us all the way through. No matter how deep, how hard, how painful, how awful the season is, his promise is that there is resurrection life through the valley of death. He promises that if it's not okay yet, it's not the end yet. For us, we might be in a season, wherever we are, that it's hard. Maybe we've lost someone. Maybe we're sick. Maybe we're in the, bit, in the pits of sorrow. But I want to encourage you that you're not walking alone on this road. Jesus is walking it with you. The resurrected Jesus, the one who knows what death feels like, 
knows what the road you're walking on feels like. He's walking with you. And he's not going anywhere until you get to the true end. I wanted to, to encourage you tonight, if you are in the middle of something, if you're walking a painful road, and the truth is all of us will walk this road at some point or another, but if you are in it right now and you would like to have a moment to have the Lord open your eyes to his presence, well, I want to encourage you during the worship set that we're going to have in a few minutes. There's going to be a prayer team over here. Seek them out. Come on forward. Go, hey, look, I'm really struggling and I want to see Jesus in this. Or if for some reason that's a step too far, if you've come with a friend, you can turn to them and go, hey, would you pray for me? I really want to see Jesus. And I know, I know that this isn't the ending. I want to stick around for the real ending. I want to see resurrection life in this story. I don't want to just see the grave. Romans 8, 28. There's a promise that we know that all things, even the awful things and the challenging things, God works together for the good of those who love him, who have been called accordingly to his purpose. I want to encourage you that wherever you're at now, there's resurrection. That resurrection life is for us every day now. If you'd like to find out more about St. Stephen's, please do head to our website, follow us on social media, or contact the church office.